Hi, everybody. Welcome to the OFM podcast where metabolic health matters. And today I'm back with Dr. Kat, Kathy, who is an intensivist, otherwise known as an ICU doc and a trauma surgeon. Hi, Kathy. Welcome back. Hey. Great to be here, Peter. And the reason we're having Kathy back on today is uh, about five weeks ago, was it? About five or six weeks ago. Four, four weeks four, ago. Four weeks ago, she completed her first 100 miler. So she's completed a couple of Ironmans and now a 100 miler. And I said, let's, let's debrief and talk about this and get it on, get it recorded. But I said, I want you to wait for the bounce. And so we're here in that bounce phase where you're starting to feel your oats in terms of, of the, the adaptive stress, the hormesis, the super compensation, the training effect from that event. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about moving forward. We're going to talk about general health uh, and what you're, what you're experiencing today. So welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. I feel great. Yeah. So I wanted you to, to describe what your first 100 miler was like, especially compared to the Ironman. I might be able to provide a little bit of context, but having done some pretty big events, you can g give us some context and perspective. And, and for the audience now, we're not expecting anybody to have to do an Ironman or run 100 miles, but there are some of us out there that have that, I guess we'll say the need to see what we we're capable of and kind of go a little of the distance. And it doesn't make anyone better or worse. In fact, I somehow think that sometimes it's, it's everybody's own journey, right? But it does provide really valuable insights that anybody who's serious about their metabolic health can take these nuggets that we're learning from people like Kathy, Peter Mortimer, Jeff Browning, Bree Lambert Sanders, and so many other athletes of well athletes of a certain age because now you know all these athletes are in their 40s 50s 60s and even 70s so and you know still out there crushing it so dr kathy because you're a doctor and we're gonna we're gonna frame this a little bit down the road here i want you to just i'm gonna let you go now i gotta stop talking well i uh you know i always for many years now almost eight years since i really changed the way I thought about what it means to be healthy and started to, you know, work with Peter. I always promised myself from that point on that I wasn't going to expect anything of my patients, you know, that I wouldn't expect of myself. And so, as you said, I, I don't expect anybody to go out and run a hundred miler, but the hundred miler for me is a, is a test scenario for my own health. And, you know, it's a test to see if what I'm doing is working. And then I start to get curious about how far I can go down the rabbit hole of what it means to be healthy in general. And also, really, with my own example, dispel, you know, the myth that as you get older, you can expect decline and a, a, a lessened sense of well-being, when in fact, it's really not true at all. So. You know, I'm used to a really, really long day as a trauma surgeon all these years, uh, you know, 24 hour shifts, 36 hour shifts, on the go working. So I think a lot of my life has been, as you say, Peter, an endurance event. So everything I've done up to this point, even the 50 miler I did, the JFK 50, I never really doubted that I could finish it. You know, as it's just, you know, as you say, like a long day at the office. But I started thinking about, and I, I usually finish these races, a full Ironman and the 50 miler well within myself. You know, it don't hurt. I don't really, I don't really suffer. You know, it's just it's fun and it's fun to go all day and it's exciting to be out there with everybody. But this 100 miler was really the first event I signed up for to see if I could do it. And I really had some questions in my mind about whether or not I could do it. So it was really exciting for me, not only from the perspective of what the body can do, but from the perspective of what it really means to fuel a race like that. And it was really surprising because 
the conditions were pretty extreme. It was very, very hot. It was the hottest day of the year so far. It was in the high, it was over 90. And with the heat index, I'm sure it was in the high 90s. And not just the heat, but uh, it was unrelenting sun. It was just- you had, no, you had nowhere to hide, right? There's nowhere to hide. And, um, and then part of the track uh, was on a fire road, which was white and the sand that we were on was white. So there was a lot of even reflection and the sun was, it was pretty rough. Well, and, a lot of the footing was just walking and walking and running in sand, right? Which, which also it was the trail, but there was a, there were parts of it. It was so dry that turned into the sugar sand, especially the further we went because it was, it was, it was uh, five 20 mile loops. that just turned into, you know, sugar sand, which it's tough to run in sand. So, uh, but I got to tell you, it was phenomenal. I, I, I barely ate anything. As a matter of fact, my family and my support crew were actually concerned that I wasn't eating anything. And I said, well, I'm carrying my fuel with me because once I got into a deep fat burn, I really, I wasn't hungry. I even was kind of concerned. I was like, I should, maybe I should eat. I didn't even want, I didn't even want sugar. And uh, I, I, you know, because OFM, we don't, we're not scared of carbs, but we just use them in a certain way, especially on race day to fuel. So I started out fasted and I would say I went the first 40 miles fasted. Essentially, I took a Vespa every two hours and an alt red every two hours. And I just made sure I kept up with salt and fluid uh, because we were, I was sweating. And uh, after that, it what I didn't get hungry. I would start to feel a little sluggish, like like tired, like uh, mentally. And that's when I was just kind of bored, not really even tired, just kind of like, oh, this is just I'm out here pretty much alone. I really stopped listening to my music, and I was just looking around at the trees. I was a little bit afraid of the wildlife because I saw an alligator, and I saw snakes. And I was afraid, like, I was going to get eaten. That was really my biggest fear. And I can't believe you crazy people run in California where they're like mountain lions. And I did. Yeah, I, I, get, I, get in I get in trouble all the time for running alone. All, oh, you like know, I, get, I get like, how you doing? I'm like, no, the bears fear me. And they well, do. I was sure that around each corner I was going to run into something. So then on my third loop, I took a knife, my little pocket knife. So I felt a little bit better. But, um, so I would just have, eventually I started taking a little, uh, a, a bit of honey, or uh, I had a, those um, little Spanish fruit roll-ups. Yeah, the, and, yeah, yeah. Those. And just a little, you know, five or 10 carb, uh, calorie little treat was enough. And I felt I would just perk right up, you know? And um, in the morning, when it was cooler, that's when I, after, you know, I would put, I pushed. And then during the heat of the day, I just managed myself, managed the salt and water. And I first started to feel hungry along about um, one or two in the morning. So you're talking about, uh, I start at seven. So seven, seven, 12. So like 18 hours in, uh, or maybe it was, a, I guess it was more than that, right? It got eight hours, hours in. Yeah. I almost got a little bit hungry. So before I went out for a night loop, I ate half of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and uh, just barely ate that. I really wasn't that hungry. And it was a, a beautiful running through the night. Um, yeah. So, so you really, I mean, because the heat index were so um, high, you were kind of on the bubble of the cutoff during the, the, the day, the afternoon of the first day. But, but what happened was is the, the night as the, as it cooled off and you went into night, you really picked up the pace. Yeah. And I felt good. And um, again, it was, I was afraid. It was my first time like out in like kind of wilderness at night. And luckily uh, one of my friends showed up and then my, my partner, they paced me through the hours of the night. So I wasn't alone, but you know, again, I was sure something was going to happen out there. You know, I'm kind of a suburban 
you know, girl. And <laughs> here I was like in the middle of this natural area. And uh, but I was <laughs> there. And actually, the comforting thing at night was that I could see it was there in the open grass areas. This is about this thing's only about 3000 acres. You could see the headlamps of other people. Whereas during the day, you couldn't see anybody else, really, unless you passed them or they passed you. So, um, and it never really cooled off at night. Like, it went down to, like, you know, like 75. <laughs> so well, 75 uh, must feel great compared to, like, 95 or 98. It did. It did. Yeah. Almost a chill. Almost a chill. Yeah. But um, uh, And were, were the stars out or was the moon out? It was, I mean, it yeah, it was yeah. the gift of after that unrelenting sunny day was no clouds in the sky. There were beautiful stars. And uh, so the as I started to relax and not be so worried out there and just focus, I started to narrow my focus on finishing and doing well, keeping up the pace, keeping moving. And then it was funny, like everything else kind of fell away. I got into that zone and I wasn't, I was, the last loop I was like, talking to the alligators like just try and come and get me whereas the first loop i was afraid they were going to come <laughs> and actually uh but then by the end i knew that i was uh you know your mind clicks on to this kind of more powerful place so yeah you smell it well like with horses you smell the barn you get you know you get like i say the first 100k is nothing more than what we evolved to do which is being on our feet all day right it was a long day but but then you get into that no man zone from about mile 65 to 85. And then once you get to that mile 85 to 88, you know, you've come that far and you know, you only got 15, 12 miles left to go. It's like, you really do smell the barn, just like a horse senses that they're heading back. Yeah. And uh, so it was a really phenomenal experience. And the hardest thing truly was taking care of my feet because the sand and the dirt, is so fine that it gets into your shoes. So I was careful to take care of my feet. I learned that from watching Jeff Browning's documentary about his Moab 240 win. He talked about his feet and foot care and how important that was. And I had gaiters on and it was a whole new experience for me going that distance. And how do you, you know, take care of different things? Uh, I had no GI issues, so I didn't have to worry about going to the bathroom. You know, I barely ate. I don't, I think we figured it out. I didn't even eat a thousand calories for the whole 31 hours. And uh, I spent, probably, ha probably half of those calories were just Vespa calories. Yes, they were. Because I took a Vespa every 12 hours. And then last week I took a cup. And in the heat, I took an extra one here and there. Yeah. yeah. But, and I, I looked at my spreadsheet of my times and I spent four and a half hours in my little camp, which, blew my mind so had i just been more careful like you told me beware the chair uh, but i actually thought that meant don't sit down i didn't realize it meant time in in kind of yeah. in your base camp and so i should have if i had just kept that to 15 or 20 minutes i could have cut my time by about two and a half hours and uh, would have had a much better finish time but even so there was only a 27% finisher rate. I think the heat got to a lot of people and the sun. So I was surprised. It was my best finish ever at my oldest racing age. You know, at a 56, I was third female overall. And 50, 56 chronologically. Now, what, who, yes. what was that? Did you have, was it a nurse PA or a patient tell you, you, you they couldn't believe you were your <laughs> chronological age? Yeah. And I probably, I mean, I'm racing better than I ever have. You know, and on, honestly, I was looking back at my training. I had one week of training that even approached 100 miles. I think it was like 75 miles. Everything else was kind of like two to three days a week on a bad week, bad week of, of you know, anywhere from six to 10 miles uh, at a clip. So maybe not even 50 mile weeks. Yeah, 30, 40 mile weeks, yeah. So I was amazed at, so I started making all kinds of excuses. Well, if the weather had been easier, more people would have finished. I wouldn't have done so well. But I realized, you know, that's part of it. It's not so much what you can do when conditions are great, but what can you, not only that, but what can you do when conditions are, you know, torture 
and you deep you, you kind of can dip into this metabolic reserve that you don't know you have and I see how it makes you it, it affects not only your body this race but your mind because there's something you know if you if you subscribe out there to the central governor theory of your body you know being wired for survival and it starts to shut you down when it because it knows your capacity this event changed my mind about it's not i'm not being dramatic about like the whole world like what's possible when yeah, it, you re and you reset your governor because what I, you know like what we've talked about is what's considered normal today is actually sick we've lowered those standards yes so low that the bar is set low and 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 again folks we're not set, suggesting you need to run 100 miles but that that governor even in sport is set so low on a metabolic level right because athletes are able to you know we're able to do things just because of that whole fight or flight cortisol glucose burning pathway people are able to do pretty incredible things but if you do that too much there's unintended consequences but with this metabolic like you say with with your metabolism primed to burn fat as your aerobic energy source and pushing yourself out there as you did in your training you did the training this time it wasn't like jfk where you had yeah and you showed up but you're you're that central governor got reset to a whole nother level 100 percent, and you know it's not just about it being reset for the race or or physical activity physical activity but i was thinking about it you know when i go to work every day if you pay attention a lot of what you hear these days oh i'm so tired oh i'm so stressed i never heard that at home growing up i never remember hearing that like around like when people even when i was like in college people getting together it's almost like like people didn't speak it because they didn't feel it in the same way as we feel it today like my parents like went all day long and my grandparents were always busy all day long and i never i mean in the evening they'd say okay it's time for bed it was never like oh my god i have to get to bed it was never like that and they had busy physical days and stressful days from the perspective of life stressors i mean they weren't any different back then and i realized like people speak exhaustion literally all day long even like like at the grocery store you know when you walk in hey how are you oh i'm good i'm almost to get, I'm, I'm almost time to get off i'm tired you know people speak it and there's no evolutionary advantage to being weak and tired well you even see it in their body language yes yeah people and you look at even like schools like i used to go wait for my daughter to pick her up from school and um, and or you go to a, like a college campus and people are very low tone and very uh, kind of sluggish a lot and that's not a um, if a lion happens to jump out of the bushes at that moment that lion's going to have a, a choice buffet because there's going to be any number of people that won't escape whereas you look at like a herd of gazelle that lion, even getting the weakest of those, that lion has to really work for it. So, you know, my professor used to talk about the, the stress response and the fight or flight response in the ICU all the time. That was his big thing. That's why I just said that. He used to say, so when a lion jumps out from behind the bushes, this is the response. And so, although we've evolved socially and socioeconomically, our physiology is has not kept up with the last you know 200 or 250 years of social evolution so we're still that hunter gatherer we're still that flight animal in times of threat and uh we have come as you said to accept now this this kind of dumbed down weakened state as what's normal with a kind of so a uh, global consciousness that we are weak and will continue to weaken as we age and 
What I like about these events is that particularly on our program, we're proving that our athletes are getting stronger as they've changed to a true metabolic, physiologically correct way of eating. You can bombard the body with stress, and instead of it being a stress that breaks you down, it's a stress that is the cliche that makes you stronger because you get that bounce. Peter's talking about the bounce, and most people don't know what he's talking about, but I was, after this 100 miler, I was, I finished at about two o'clock in the afternoon. We went home and I was, I felt my joints in a way I never felt them before, but it was just sore. I wouldn't say I had any pain. I was just really, really sore. And, joint, joint soreness. Yeah, and I had two blisters. One on each little toe. That was it. And uh, by, so that was Sunday I finished. And Tuesday I was like back to normal. No edema. I had trace edema on Monday, like Sunday night and Monday when I stopped moving. Only when I stopped moving. I finished yep. the race. I had no. And Tuesday I went and got a pedicure because that sand just wrecked my, my toenails. I had, I always have a nice French pedicure. And they were just, I couldn't get the dirt out. So. And then those poor, those poor girls. <laughs> on Thursday, like 90 hours later, uh, is that 96 hours later? I went back to work, you know, four days in. And I just listened to the Florida trail running podcast. They interviewed a female who ran with me. She's a, she runs a lot. Uh, and uh, the three top male finishers, they interviewed them. And I got to tell you, they were talking about, like, she forgot her, um, she's an experienced ultra marathoner. And she forgot her, entered all her food and, and fuel on the first lap out. She had her water, but she forgot everything else. And she said she was, she was so frightened and she couldn't even think of anything because she didn't know how she was going to get through the loop without her fuel. We're talking about the first 10 miles because you came in about every 10 miles. So the four, there was also a 40 mile event that started like a half an hour after us and her, her husband gave all her fuel to another runner, her friend who caught her at eight and a half miles. So then she said she could relax. And because, and she did, she said after three miles, uh, she starts with, um, I think she said every, half hour every 40 minutes gel 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 burrito then gel 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 like some kind of other like uh some kind of tortilla or something so i don't know how you could possibly eat all that food but i finished ahead of her and she kept talking about how brutal it was and how exhausting and you know it was an effort but what i'm saying is i didn't go in it for the suffering I got in it for the performance because the ask was completely reasonable. People not only look at what's our dumbed down idea of what's normal now as normal, but they look at something like what I just did as like super normal when it's actually natural. So we've totally like confused, juxtaposed the two, you know? And so as a doctor, I feel like it's my responsibility to tell people that your body is not only what you now think of as supernatural, but it's completely within your purview to achieve this. And you don't have to do it by running a hundred miler, but you could, you know, you could just never meet me in the hospital, you never meet me in the ICU and live, you know, 120, maybe 140 years at a high performing level. Now let's let's talk about that in a minute. So let's bring a little reality to this too, because I mean, part of the journey of a hundred miles or an Ironman is you do get tested down to your core. I mean, mentally, emotionally, right? Where it's like, this really sucks. Why am I doing it? I mean, I'm sure those those thoughts crossed your mind here and there. Not it wasn't like a death march of of constantly saying this sucks, but probably during the heat of the day and going into the night where you really weren't sure of, of, you know, 
lions and tigers and bears, oh, oh, no, oh, me, oh my, that, you know, it's like you question why you're doing that, but yet you you keep moving forward. And that's that's part of the, the journey and part of the challenge because you, you need to have those moments of, of self-doubt or questioning why you're doing that because that's what allows that governor to be raised. Well, it's important to get to that moment because that's where you ask the question, can I continue to go forward? And then that's when you have the opportunity to feel the robustness of your physiology because your mind's telling you you're going to break down, it's going to fail. And you go another mile or another two miles and you're like, I, f I feel fine. So it was, I have to say, when I started getting into, there was one moment, like I, like you had told me, like usually, you know, when you get to mile 65, 85, um, that's where you kind of have to dig deep and see what you're made of. Yeah, I know actually, what I call it, dead man's land. Right, right. But for me, it was like mile 40. I didn't want to keep going. Just, I think maybe because it was hot or I was like, but I think that too, what happens to us as we get into that deep fat burn and we start to pump out ketones too, like you get a clarity of mind that helps you focus because again, there's no evolutionary advantage for you to be making an effort like this and not be able to think clearly and protect yourself. But you, there, there, there's, there's actually the evolutionary imperative, correct? That's correct. Because, and everything starts to, your mind, start, my mind started to sort what was important, what isn't important. And it started to, to kind of ignore things that were irritating, but I had a sense they were unimportant from the sense of life threatening or going to cause an irreparable pro a problem. And you felt this kind of like, and I never thought about getting to the finish line. I started to get curious. What if I just went down this road? What if I just pushed hard just till I got to the end of this road? What or if I just... Or telephone pole or what next tree? And then I was like, oh, look at this. Look how this, this um, road like snakes through these beautiful palm trees. What if I were a race car or a horse, a thoroughbred, and I just ran through and I started to, I wasn't in a sense doing it on purpose to try to keep my mind occupied. I just all of a sudden started to think about how beautiful this was and started to feel the, just the durability of my body. And imagine if you think you're going to fall off a cliff, but you know, the road starts, like, did you see that, that uh, there was a scene in one of the Raiders of the Lost Ark movies where he's going to get the Holy Grail and there's a huge cavern in front of him, like, the, like the, a Grand Canyon type of cavern and he's at the edge of the cliff and the Holy Grail is on the other side and he was told and he knew from his research that there is a path there, but he had to step into that abyss as if, and, and it was fire and everything. And there was, it looked like he was going to fall right off the edge. But when he took the step, the brick path appeared and he had to take each, as he took each step, the pathway appeared under his feet and he got across and he got the Holy Grail. And that's what it felt like. I was like, cause I remember, you know, David Goggins talks a lot about when you have reached your the end of the road, where you think you can't go any further, you're really only probably at about 40% of your capacity. And uh, he has an incredibly strong mind, but he has a strong mind in part because like he took a chance to go forward when his body said stop. And he realized his body was just bluffing. And I think that's the kind of, you know, and he does it on a different kind of fueling strategy as I understand it. But he says that, he says, what if I was the one that could do it? And I, I started asking myself during the race, I said, what if everything that 
I've been doing, that Peter and I talk about this physiology that I know to be true, is not only true, but it's even more than I understand. What if? If that's the case, then I can keep going. And I just kept going and going. And had I, when I stopped, I was ready to stop because I was kind of like dirty and I am a girl. I mean, you get really dirty out there, you know? You just want to take a shower. But I could have just, I could have done another loop, you know? And I didn't start to hurt or stiffen up or anything um, until I stopped running. You know, the body's just made to move. And it was, it was like the most beautiful feeling to feel like you have no bottom, like you could just continue to go. And that physical experience affected my mind tremendously. Well, and, and but you have to step off into the abyss to do that. And, yes. and what we see today is, what I see is in, in our lifetime, the evolution of man has just accelerated exponentially. So we're, we're ensconced in what I call the man-made construct. And it's gotten so convenient and so comfortable that's part of that dumbed down normal is we we live in a risk-free environment i mean all our strategies now in terms of everyday life are, are centered around our money our retirement our our house our cars and they're all very comfortable and me being a neanderthal uh, you know i sort of eschew all this stuff because i see this as as taking away like i don't know if you remember dr strange love the, the brilliant stanley kubrick movie oh there's this one colonel who talks about his you know his whole being and essence being drained by these forces including women you know that and it, it it was a brilliant line uh but i i look at this as that but on on the on the note of that and and speaking to what you just talked about, I want to like condense it in terms of not the physical experience, but the mental emotional thing. What I see that happens with people when they do a hundred and they don't have like any dysfunction, because you see that just I'm going to go off on a little rabbit hole, but in, in like ultra endurance, like Iron Man and 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 hundred milers, you see a subset of people whose whole identity is wrapped up in their sport. Right. It's like, what are you running from? Right. But somebody like you, you're a high performing person in every aspect of your life. And I'm not saying that, to, you know, you're 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 a, both a trauma surgeon and an intensivist. You have a stable, loving relationship and family. You know, your daughter has all these different activities you're involved in. So you're, you know, doing your sport or your hobby at the level you're doing is just an extension of you okay and so we all have that potential to where everything we do you don't have to be perfect but you excel at it. i mean you didn't run a 18 hour 100 miler you ran a 30 some odd a 29 hour 100 miler but you did it and you excelled but what I was bringing to is like by going over that abyss you gain what i call that quiet confidence that you can execute in every aspect of your life and it really and i think that that's probably part of the, that's a big part of the bounce is you know coming out of that going through those lows going through a few days of recovery where you're really tired some joint soreness blisters healing and then starting that journey back as your body starts to get the super compensation right i mean you're going to be flat for a few weeks right but now you're here yeah. at this this point but not just the fact we'll talk about the physical aspects of it in a minute but but just you know in terms of our conversations over the last three or four weeks the brief ones we've had you know what i see is your sense of purpose and mission whether it's in your home life and family you know devotion to your partner your daughter that but also to serving and helping in the ICU I mean it's it's your day job right but it it's still it's your it's also your calling and it's like I'm here to help and serve people and you're doing the best you can under the circumstances but you're also seeing hey Houston we got a problem here we need to back this up and 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 where you can working to make positive changes both on an individual and macro level 
Yeah, you know, the biggest emotion I see in the ICU, in the hospitals, in the emergency room, people are bewildered. Like, how did this happen? How did I get here? How can I not come back here? How can I get out of this situation? And I talk to patients, you know, once the crisis is over, I give people some resources. This is, if you want to not end up here again, you have to change something that you were doing that got you here in the first place. And people are so convinced that it's their genetics dictating, their genetics or something like the frailty of the human body, the inevitability of decline, that they can't fight against it. So in a sense, like people almost have this um, feudalistic idea about what's possible. And when I start to talk to people, you know, I can show them the science that backs up what we do, but you can see that it resonates with them. You know, it's like when you hear something that's true, you know it, you know, and you can see that, especially for people that have been doing all the right things, taking all the medicines that their doctors have been giving them, getting their screening colonoscopy, doing everything that modern medicine says you should do to stay healthy and they still get sick. They are bewildered. They're like, but I did, but I eat well, but I, and a lot of these people are telling the truth. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they, they, in their mind, they actually believe because that's, they're doing what, what the standard of care that the dietary recommendations are. Right. So, you know, it's, uh, it's a, I think that at some level, the truth of what we speak resonates with that still that ancient physiology, you know, that we have inside of us that's so resilient. And it's, you know, you get, I, I'm at the point now where I'm thinking, what, what isn't, what, I don't think anything isn't possible, you know, because now you start to talk about the resilient body feeding a resilient mind. And then the mind then allows what we know about epigenetics in quantum physics, the mind then being able to shape uh, and influence biology in the moment, then you're Well, and it's, ju it's just the central governor that allows you to push forward and get that adaptive stress because you, the body has to have that adaptive stress to constantly renew itself. And if it doesn't, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at you as a chronologic 56 year old well next week i'll be 57. i i know i know it's on my it's on my calendar actually and uh and and we're going to talk about that because you're doing something something special for that day yes <laughs> and you and your partner and your daughter think you're probably freaking out of your mind nuts but it's 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 actually it's actually something that i uh think people should do so but it's like these the, your patients in the ICU or people you're talking to, it almost seems like you have to push yourself over that abyss, i.e. wind up in the ICU and have Dr. Kathy give you the, 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 the tough love. Well, right? that's, a, that's, that's the opportunity most people need to change. So, you know, just like, uh, you know, most people need a trauma or a traumatic event in their lives to kind of wake them up and say, I I'm going to do something different because it's so shocking that people take notice of what's going on. And often that will be an opportunity to change. You know, we used to see that with our trauma patients. There's a window like when a young man would come in shot, some kind of violence. There was a window there where the ego was gone. And it was more about, oh, you know, they start asking questions. It's a small window because once you start feeling better and the threat, the mortal threat is passed and people start to relax and you go back and you stop thinking about it in the same way. But it's the same thing that happens in my ICU. People are, you know, people are bargaining with God in that moment in the ICU with a stroke or a heart attack or some critical event. And if only I can get out of this thing, then I'll change. And there's they're more receptive to that idea. But why do we have to wait for that? Because I'm telling you, imagine if we taught our children this. You know, children are being born more obese now. And more children are, are having trouble with uh, hyperglycemia, 
hyperinsulinemia because it starts in the womb, right? And so yep. for the people that think, well, it's my genetics, it is, but that's mostly 95% of it is because you have the same patterns of behavior that shaped the genetics of your parents. And then you have this, but you can change that. And well-being is your natural state as opposed to getting sicker. So it's exciting, you know, for me. And so this kind of racing and challenging is not so much, uh, I'm not really necessarily trying to do it to show other people, but it demonstrated to myself too. And, and it's a great way to live because you feel so good. Like I feel good all the time. And not a lot of people can say that. And how do you feel now, like four weeks out? I mean, do you feel like you, better than when you went into that race in terms of oh, yeah. physical, confidence, emotional, yep. you know? Just everything just goes up a notch, you know, like everything like uh, got better. Everything was great, but it just got better. And you just kind of walk around with this. I wonder if it's the way, you know, I have some friends in the military that are high level, like Navy SEALs and stuff. And you see that about them. They have this quiet, like, yep. they're like the nicest people, but they're, they're like, they're lethal. Like in a heartbeat with like a spoon, they can, you know, like probably take you out. Yeah. A thousand, you know, and it's just a way of, it's not believing you're something else. It's really understanding who you actually are, that you have this capacity and it's not that it, it doesn't have to be developed, but I mean, look at the Spartans. Like they started with their young children. Imagine if we started teaching kids, because basically what we were talking about earlier now, people are paying other people to do the things that used to keep us fit and healthy and moving so that they can sit on the couch and get sicker. We're paying other people to absorb things so that we can have more leisure when in fact, like, you know, I was talking to my landscaper about this. I said, you're successful because other people don't want to cut their grass. And, but going out, like you always tell me, like I have a long run, like a four or six hour run and then spend the rest of the day moving. So I'll go out in the morning and have my run. And then I'll spend the day in my backyard, like moving my pots or planting or dragging something somewhere, moving all day, cleaning the house, whatever it is to continue, you know, moving. And that's so important. But people think the goal is sitting on the couch and relaxing, right? Did you hear, when you hear people speak it, oh, I'm going to go home and sit down and relax. I'm going to go home. But they're sitting all day at work. So it's like they're paying other people to, in a sense, make them sicker. You know what I mean? And more miserable. Um, and more miserable because I have a podcast. We haven't we haven't released it yet with Rocco Bellick, who's a award winning documentary filmmaker, and he made the movie Happy. And he talks exactly about you about this. He interviewed a close friend of his who's a very successful producer in the movie business, and this guy had this epiphany. He was living in this big house and had you know all the resources, and he said. My landscapers, people cut my lawn, lawn were happier than I were because they're out there cutting and singing and whistling and having a good time. And I'm like worried about this, that money, you know, projects, stressed out. And he, he you know, to, to this guy's credit, he, he bailed on it all and went and lived in this sort of interesting trailer park in Malibu where Rocco lives, which is, it's, it's t totally cool. I'll have to take you there sometime. Yeah, right? you know, it's interesting that um, I lost my train of thought, but um, the... I think that the more not I would say not menial tasks, but those things that have us, you know, doing calisthenics. We used to have, you know, having parents from Russia. We had lots of visitors that would come over as I, when I was a kid from Russia, and it was so funny because even what my parents made us do. But these people would come before they would go to bed every night. They were doing like calisthenics, like mm -hmm. jumping jacks, push-ups, squats, just to. And I thought. I think back now, I thought, here they were in America. We had much more of a sedentary type lifestyle. They were trying to, you know, keep up their level of activity. And these days, all we do is, you know, like, go and sit down. We go everywhere we go, we sit down. You know, we sit down at a restaurant. And, and, sit and sitting is a modern man-made construct. We either squatted 
laid down or, or walked or stood or walked or ran. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Like, I usually carry all my grocery bags, you know, from the when I go grocery shopping. And I always get offers, can I help you with that? Oh, couldn't you find a cart? And I say, no, I, it's like part of my workout. I have really strong arms. So carrying these groceries is really, you know, just makes me stronger. You know, <laughs> they're like, look at me like I'm a little bit nuts, but just like the, all the simple things um, make all the difference. So, yeah. And so one thing I want to interject here is like when you were talking about the ketones and all, that's what, that's a state where I call where you are in that deep beta oxidation fat burn and you, you become what I call blood sugar stable because you're just cleaving off these free fatty acids for most of your energy and then your liver, depending on your effort level, is spitting out ketones and glucose to meet that metabolic need without catabolizing protein, without burning through your glycogen stores and you have that mental stability and not only does it give you what you described in terms of that mental focus and ability to assess and reason without conscious thought, you know, you're in that zone, right? The zone. But by being blood sugar stable, you also don't lose your, your focus or your motor skills and coordination. And like whether you're a special forces operator or a figure skater or a hockey player or a soccer player or a basketball player, when you or a surgeon <laughs> or, a sur or a surgeon doing surgery, right? Okay, you when you start to get sloppy, you've already lost your edge because that blood sugar stability goes before you even sense the fatigue and the sloppiness. Once yes. you you know, and, and so getting in that state is is just so critical. And you hear that a lot from ultra marathoners, like uh, that they they start to get hallucinate, get confused. And you start, I actually, in the night loop that I did by myself, because I the sun set while I was still out there, so it was dark, and uh, I saw a light coming uh, perpendicular from me, and it was a, a woman, and she said, oh, I saw your light, and I knew I had gone off the trail, you know, because it was hard to see at night. There was just small flags on the trail, and every it, it all looked the same after a while. And she came out, she said, I followed your light. And she said, um, she said, I'm, I do these races and I'm used to getting sleepy on my feet at night. But today, I think, and it was very hot, remember, she says, today was the first time I ever was falling asleep on my feet during the day. She said, but I saw your light, so I knew I could, I'll just follow you. And uh, there was no point in that race where I felt at risk like mentally, like I was not confused. I, I, I was very focused. So um, a couple of times I was startled. There was a, I think I came upon a bobcat at one point. And I was just, I even had, I was interested because I had downloaded all this music and I thought for sure I would be listening to music to keep my mind going. But after the first like, 15 miles, I actually turned it off and I didn't really use it anymore. So I was running and I was just looking at the trees and I was noticing things and I was curious about what's around the next corner. And right next to me, I heard, it was about maybe 10 feet away, the biggest snarl I have ever heard, like a cat. So that like popped me right into attention and I started yelling and I heard uh, the noise as it and it was moving away from me. It must have jumped out of the brush and gone away from me. So I picked up like a stick and I ran the rest of the loop with that stick. Um, and then I got my knife and I felt better. But I don't know what I think I would do if something jumped on me. But I would, you know, better to have a knife than not have a knife. But, um, but, the, but that's, that's what your fight or flight physiology is for, right? right? So otherwise, I was in a zone, but I was not unaware, like I said, of the important things like my footing and everything. So I was, uh, it was, I did, the only, I, you asked me how I was feeling like since the race, uh, after maybe the first four or five days, what I did notice is feeling a little bit like, like sad, not sad, but a little bit like. Anticlimactic. Yeah. And I realized, you know, you hear that about high level athletes. Like there have been, unfortunately, quite a few like Olympic type athletes that have you know, committed suicide, you miss, I think I was missing the endorphins. 
So I made sure that I started to get out there and move, and then I started to feel better and everything. You know, I started to go for a little like run or and start to just keep moving again. And I'm and I was a little bit, I have to say, a little sloppy with my diet too. <laughs> you know, after the race, I was just like, it's a good time to eat, to be really careful because you don't want to incite any inflammation. So I should be even more careful. But you know, we were celebrating, and so you know, I was my own worst enemy a little bit. But but yeah, the mental strength that this type of living affords you cannot be underestimated and then your mood like during the day at work so many things come at you and you start to realize how dramatic people are and all this like stuff going on you know i used i learned as a trauma surgeon to keep a really even temper uh, on at least on the outside but now i have that even temper on the inside too i don't have to put on an act you know and then you don't lose your mind in the midst of a crisis because you definitely see that in the in 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 my line of work, people like. <laughs> yeah, I would say so. Especially too, like when I remember when I was a young surgeon, one of the things you have to learn, and you learn this in the military too, is when it hits the fan, you have to maintain your composure because if you when you go into a flight or fight response. You, you don't think as well. You lose your peripheral vision. You really narrow down your focus in a, because your only goal is to get away, is survival. So if in the midst of a crisis, you can maintain the growth, you, right? Biochemically, you only have two possible states of being. One is the survival state, like when the antelope is fleeing from the tiger. That's the cortisol state, the in, you know, the high sugar burn, the, you know, anaerobic, just get out of dodge. And then you have the creative state where the antelope is grazing biochemically. She's ready to breed and procreate. She's in a safe environment. Learning occurs in that environment. You can't learn in the fear state. So when, like, it's hitting the fan, like, in the middle of a trauma or a critical event in the hospital, being able to truly maintain that biochemical composure, then you actually are able to think. You have good peripheral vision. This is also what martial artists do. You have to, you develop your peripheral vision. So you're focused here, but you're also aware. And then ideas come to you, thoughts. Oh, I did this one. That used to happen to me in the operating room. You're looking at something, you know, that you may have only read about or something you haven't read about and it's happening. You say, what, what do I know how to do? What can I draw to this experience so it doesn't have to be like that but it could be anything happening in your life like you're in a dangerous situation or you're having a familial crisis how do you, you open your you know your your um, options but you have more potential responses that will have a favorable outcome when you're in that flight or fight response it's kind of like no matter what happens there might be collateral damage but that's okay so you know it's this lifestyle this OFM lifestyle and these challenges that develop metabolic resilience and mental resilience just set you up for a better all around experience in all aspects of your life. And I think well, that's I, what most people are looking for when they start running, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but they don't, I think people don't realize just how profound that is, that cortisol response pathway, and we're just primed Today's world has people primed to, and on a hair trigger, and I've been seeing this lately, yes. more and more, just how people are just, they're just constantly on the lookout for that next ping, whether it's a text or some other driver doing something stupid or some minor crisis at work. It, it, they're, just, they're just primed and it's like, they don't understand how, profound that is in terms of that's not their physiology and then that creates that fear mentality and, and once you have fear in somebody whether it's both conscious or subconscious they stop thinking they just react right you don't step back from the situation like you as a trauma surgeon you have somebody coming with a gunshot wounds or traffic accident you have to step back for a moment and then collate a bunch of information and maybe you've got a standard of care or procedure but it doesn't work well it's like 
maybe I, I heard I heard I read this paper about some other procedure. Let's try that. And I'm I'm sure that's happened many times in your career where you just deviate. Just like just like I've I've had this conversation with special special ops guys. The the you know it's it's like I say in the military, you train by the book, you do the rep rep petition to get that basic yeah. right then, but but when the the you know what hits the fan the, the rule book goes out the window and you start fighting and, and a lot of times it's 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 as far from the book as you can get yes yes 100 percent. and you're right uh you know so and it's interesting because uh, i don't want people to feel bad about where they are but you there's you can start from any point and start to develop this robustness. And what's amazing is I don't think we can underestimate or underemphasize, or I don't think we can emphasize enough the power of the event to cause you to leapfrog forward, as opposed to a lot of people do, you know, train for races like a marathon or an Ironman, and they're one and done because they get broken by it in a bad yeah. way. So this lifestyle, you're you're better, say at work, but then you don't realize that that feeds into then you're going to have a better workout. And it's, you have that, workout. it's that upward. It, it's upward just like this it, upward yeah. spiral that yep. all these areas start to you get a synergy, right? So the sum of the parts is the whole is greater than the sum of the parts because everything yep. starts to work together and. I mean, it's just phenomenal, and it's so uh, it's so contrary to what we normally hear now, driven by even in medicine and uh, in marketing, what 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 drives that now? Because a lot of it is uh, addict addiction, addiction, and fear based substance. marketing, yeah, messaging, fear based so, messaging. You know, the important thing for people to know is that any sort of suggestion that the body is weak or sick or subject to decline is really not true yeah so, so one put one point i want to make here that i i have that that's really germane to this conversation is part of this whole fear thing that we're seeing as a societal thing and and certainly we've seen it the last three years without getting my tinfoil hat too too big here is this fear thing and, and and that's all about control and and we want to control our situation because we're scared of being out of control right the what ifs the 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 alligators the lions the tigers the bears uh figuratively or literally right but we don't have we have that fight or flight thing mechanism because that was put in there over millions of years of evolution to, to save our life. But now that same physiology is like, oh, do I have enough to retire? Can I make my payment? You know, my my kid is having a meltdown at school or a crisis there. Uh, you, you just see this. And and so we, we all want control and bigger entities want control because there's more control. And, but, I think everybody needs to step back from that. Like you say, get rid of that fear and step back and say, the only thing we can control is ourselves and, and get that empowerment. But that's right. And that that's the kind of confidence that this lifestyle yes. gives people because people are worried about controlling things so that they can eliminate the threat they sense to their own well being. That's right. And if you what you see like in the special ops, what I feel uh, from this race, what I know about my own health is that you, as you said, number one, the only thing you control is yourself. And number two is because you can control yourself and you have been controlling yourself and you have these experiences of your own physical and mental power, you don't fear the threat because you know that in any situation you have the capability, the capacity, and the resiliency to meet it. And if you don't, you've been in the situation before, if you haven't experienced it before, you can make it up effectively as you, you go along. You problem solve. And so, you know, that's what's really amazing. You know, so if you read about, like, one of the missions in uh, to go um, get uh, one of the bad guys, Bin Laden, 
I was reading these seals were talking about their experience and you know um, one of the helicopters was crashing right so for most people if you said if you're on a helicopter or plane it says and they say we're we're gonna crash what is, what's the first thing most people think think i'm, I'm gonna, gonna die yeah. you know what this you know what the navy seals think when they when the when the captain said the pilot said we're gonna crash land and they're like way up in the sky and like it's like kind of the situation where you you will die if it crashes they start going okay so look when we hit the ground they don't even think there, there's no fear okay when we hit the ground you know it looks like we're going down towards the left so we're gonna that's gonna be the low end we're gonna exit to this door you guys go out this door you guys go out this. they have the complete expectation that they will survive the crash and be able to go on and complete the mission so like even me like even if i say okay we're going to crash. There will be survivors. In my mind, I'm thinking, okay, there's going to be femur fractures. That's not how these guys think. They're like, okay, they have so much confidence in who they are that they feel invincible. And that's our natural state of being. Well, it's interesting you say that because when they when they do that special forces training, they do, I mean, an ultra emulates that to a certain extent, not quite to it, but they're sent out with nothing and they got to make do on nothing and it gives them that quiet confidence that oh they're gonna if they got to eat snakes and gophers so be it yeah. <laughs> or they don't eat and and because they do send those guys out to do those kind of things as part of their training yeah. and and so they're special but they're special because they've chosen to develop that capacity well, they, they so that's what I mean, to tell people is I'm not I'm not anybody special. Like I'm just I'm I have the same physiology that everybody else has, and but you can and I started developing it. I mean, you and I have only been working together like um, 2013 was it? We yeah, first met? 14 I think. Yeah, 14. So yeah. Not even you know, but it it builds on itself. It's like compounded interest. You just get better and better and better and better. And I'll tell you. If um, I got a little more, I see the things that I do that my body makes up for. Like if I got a little more sleep, you know, maybe have a little bit uh, better. I'm always working at handling stress better. So, you know, you can really develop capacity starting from wherever you are. And you're powerful. People's bodies are powerful. And they're not used to hearing that. Like, look at me. I'm out of shape. I'm overweight. My dad died at 40 of a heart attack. But. That doesn't, that's the old story. And it has nothing to do with what we know scientifically today. It might not be what you hear about, but that's why our message is so important, not only to athletes, but to, um, well, everybody's an athlete from my perspective. Yeah. But everybody's, only, an, everybody's an athlete and everybody's entered in this ultra called life. That's right. <laughs> and so um, like, I, I feel like that's like the most important message and that's what everybody's hoping for because that's, you know, the way you, people just want to feel good. Well, and I think, but a lot of people feel disempowered now and they, whether they know it or not, they're, they're being steered around by their fear. I mean, just a perfect example with athletes, you know, Oh, you're going to burn through your glycogen levels. You got to take your gels. You got to take your nutrition, and and they're like fearing the bonk. And then because they're taking in so many calories and trying to race at the same time, their gut can't handle it, and shuts down. So they're they're fearing the GI issues, and it's this this cycle of fear. Even in people who are actually trying, honestly trying to be healthy, because that fear based marketing empowers them. Yes. 100 percent so let's let's move on to the next thing because you know it's like you said we're going to talk we want to talk about the bounce and and you're at that you're in that bounce phase so tell us tell us what you're doing for your birthday well i was told by my family that we could go anywhere i want to go <laughs> what were they thinking what was they thinking? thinking like you know the ritz carlton in miami you know key west we're going to be on a beach with a margarita or something you know no, so uh, at, on my birthday, I would like to do something to celebrate the number. Like on my 55th birthday, you know, I did. A, or, defi I or defy the number. Right, right. Like, so I did like a triathlon of my own making. I, I swam 5,500 meters, then I 
rode 55 miles and ran five and a half miles. So I did 55, you know, double nickel triathlon. So I'm turning 57 and serendipitously, so I was looking for some more ultras around here. And there is something I didn't know about called the Florida National Scenic Trail. It's a national trail like the Appalachian Trail or the Pacific Coast Trail, but it's contained in one state. It's one of three that are contained in one state, and it goes through the Ocala National Forest, which is not far from me. And by virtue of where you have to go in on the trail and where you can leave on the trail, it happens to be 57.1 miles. So I said, I want to do that. And they're like, really? My partner's like, oh. So, you know, he's the world's best Sherpa. And, um, and so this will be interesting for me too, because even though it's a shorter race, the distance between the water stops, it's almost totally self-supported, um, but there's just gonna be some water and ice at a couple places. So I'll have to go further without, without any other support. And um, so it's going to be fun. And it's the same type of trail. It's a little further north, so I don't know if it'll be as hot. It's going to be later in the year, so maybe. So I'm really looking forward to it. And the funny thing is, mentally, I'm like, oh, it's just 57 miles. I mean, whereas before, I would have think, oh, you know, but you run 100. So I remember watching, uh, uh, what was I watching? Oh, the Barkley Marathon. And in the middle of the 100 miler, I don't know what mile it was, but I, I, uh, I was walking and I texted uh, to my partner, if I ever say I want to try the Barkley marathons, remind me of this moment because I don't. Because <laughs> no, like you're you're not. I'm not. I'm I'm going to be right there with with him, saying no, Kathy. But I don't know. You get all scraped up and everything. But I'm starting to think now because I was thinking that way about like the there's a 200k here, coast to coast, peer to peer across Florida, and there's like a. A, a triple Ironman across the state of Florida, and then there's the Moab 240. I've never been out there. I'm starting to think so if you can go 100, maybe you could go 130, maybe you could go 150, maybe maybe 200, maybe what 240. 240 would probably be it. But then there's all these other races like the six day races and like the Mont Blanc, the crazy one, and the Dragon's Back. And I'm like, oh, I gotta better get started. There's a lot of races to. Well, there's a lot. You don't even have to do races. Like I'm into the whole just doing epic runs in the mountains by myself. I don't need a. I don't need a race, but it's. I have to say. Okay. Yeah, but what happens is it opens up. It's like you were talking earlier about this expansive thinking rather than this fear-based, singular, thought pattern that that's that's you know permeated every niche of society today you know all of a sudden you're 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 empowered so you have this expansive mindset rather than this fear-based mindset yeah and i uh you know i don't think i think differently throughout the day too now you know as opposed to there are days when like if i work at night i'm tired i think i'm, I'm ready to go to sleep but my general feeling when I get up in the morning is, I wonder how much I can get done today. Like, well, I wouldn't, you know, as opposed to, oh God, another day, just a total mental reversal and everything is more fun, you know? Yeah, we should get back. I think what the, this, this upcoming birthday run will do for you is, you know, like I say, it's a celebration of defying your age, you know, just putting the big middle finger up at this whole idea of, of aging and actually not talking about longevity, but actually making longevity happen. Well, yeah, I always, I never had a, for the longest time, like birthdays were always a big deal when we were growing up. Because quite frankly, you know, and what I do for a living, there's only one reason you don't get to have another birthday. And so from my perspective, getting a whole nother, you know, whole nother year is exciting. And I know now, I couldn't do at 55 what I've been able to do at 56. And so, again, that perspective from the way that we teach people to live is you're going to get a depth and a capacity 
as you go through that year that you didn't have the year before. So you're building capacity. And you know, again, not to go back to, um, that's why I think we see in our athletes that they're getting better as they're getting older, which is the opposite. There's very few sports where you get better when you get older. And even, you know, even in surgery, you know, I can, I make up a lot of time because of my experience. So I can accomplish things quicker than I did when I was younger from one perspective. But you normally think of people slowing down and not having uh, the resilience that they have when they're younger. And our data and the performance of our athletes and what I've done in my own life has certainly disproved that. So yep. not that we're trying to get anybody, but I'm just saying, just if there's one thing to defy, it's that with age you decline. And it's not just the cliche that older and wiser, but older and stronger. I mean, you look at indigenous populations, they live the way we advocate living. And uh, it's like old age diseases, what we think of, cancer, those kind of things were non-existent, obesity, those Yeah, diabetes, yeah. All that stuff was non-existent and, you know, like lots of these, in lots of these societies, the elders decided when they were going to die. They would go off into the woods, it was their time, and they would, they would uh, shut down, shut themselves down mentally and physically. And, um, you know, I think that, like I said, it's not that you don't have to develop this capacity and put effort into it, but not in the way people think. It's, it's not suffering. It's like pruning my rose bushes. You do that pruning so that the growth comes back even better and better and better. My yeah. rose bushes are blooming right now because I cut them back and my husband, my, uh, my your husband, your husband, your landscaper, he saying, everybody. He was like, what did you do? These look like little sticks and now they're so lush and they're full of blooms and everything, you know, but it's, it's like the bounce. You, you give them the, the metabolic stress in the way that it enhances your future performance rather than takes away from it. Yeah, and that's, that's really key that's because, yeah, and that, that's really key to get back to that, that evolutionary state of, of beta oxidation, that deep fat burn where everything's in that homeostasis of, of balance of ketones, glucose, and then mostly free fatty acids. And, and with that, you also get the, all the cellular process because, you know, beta oxidation is a, is part of that fat burning process is, is, is all your pathways for your cell walls to rebuild, your mitochondria, your hormones, your enzymes, all that's done on a, on a fat based physiology. Glucose is simply a, a quick, rapid, energy source that's right that's why you run out that's why you have to keep refueling and uh, you know so you don't even have to delve into the science of it all you have to just ask a, a very simple logical question like how would it serve you if you had to work do physical work all day and have and run out of fuel in 60 to 90 minutes that doesn't make any evolutionary sense it doesn't no, make no. any survival sense so and if you're in a tropical or you're in an environment where you don't have access to glucose, you know, on a regular basis, how does that make any sense? So why should it make sense, you know, for what we're doing now? And I think even for, for kids, uh, for young athletes, the, the mental uh, resiliency and hormonal balance, as you said, particularly in their pubescent, you know, the puberty years and whatnot. And, the, and with, the, especially with young women from Menarch through the development yes. of menses. It's so important that hormonal balance and uh, it, you know, it just, it's, it's important everywhere in, in babies for brain development um, all the way up to through that hormonal change, the, the development of, of young, young people to the prevention of chronic illness and the maintenance of, um, you know, mental acuity in, in the older population. It's just, it's just a gift that keeps giving, you know, and um, it's such a, but it's a miraculous feeling. I can tell you, I know physiology is beautiful. I mean, I see it at work every day and it's just, it just, when the body is not 
when the body is sick, it's not because something went wrong. It's because the body was unable to compensate for the wrong that was being done to it anymore. Well, and, and at that point, when you look, when you when you're able to step back and and stop judging good bad, when you look at how the etiology of cancer or diabetes or heart disease in that moment the body those cells are doing exactly what they're trying to do they're trying to survive that's correct and the body is miraculous in its ability to continue to perform even at a high level uh despite the way it's being cared for and uh, that's the most amazing thing i tell my patients that all the time like it's okay nothing's wrong you're just things are out of balance but nothing's intrinsically wrong you know you still have a, an engine that works, but we just got to change the tires. We got to put the right fuel in the in the car, and then it's going to start to run again. We got to bring those signals back of activity that tell the cells they've got to remold themselves, build mitochondria. You know, this is all pretty evident. So, yeah. anyway, Kathy, I wish you the best on your 57 miles. I think what's gonna come out of this is you're gonna be able to push yourself because it is 57 miles, not 100, right? The pacing's different, but I think we need to get together after that for another short conversation on the self-sufficiency because like you said, this is gonna have a lot longer. There's gonna be a lot more hurry up and wait with your partner and your daughter. Your daughter's probably gonna stay home or go to a friend's place. And she's gonna be, she won't be there. She'll be in a horse show, but uh. Yeah. Well, I just signed up this morning for another race, two other races, but one is it's uh, I'm experimenting with the heat again and the sun. So this race is called the Trident. And here in South Florida, the race director that ran Hungry Land, so he's kind of like one of those uh, like Barkley Marathon Lazarus guys, you know. And so he gives us, I thanked him for the opportunity for an event to test the body. You know, and so we know at the best butts, one of the things you're particularly good at helping is when you're metabolic, you're not churning out all the metabolic waste and stuff. You're very heat tolerant. Yes. So this race is called the Immolation. <laughs> uh, it's a 12 hour, 40 mile, 100, well, 99% sugar sand. So it's like this deep. And it's the highest elevation in Southern Florida here. And the the course will give us um, nothing compared to your standards, but it's all sea level here. So it'll give us, I believe, uh, like, I'm going to say it's like 7,500 feet of elevation. So you have to do one 3.3 mile loop in an hour, okay? And the last person who finishes that loop. Oh, it's the last person standing. Eliminated. And then. If you don't finish, of course, in the hour, you get eliminated. So I've never been in a race. I'm not fast. I don't think of myself as fast, but I think of myself as I can go all day. So it's going to be tough for me to go fast on the first couple of loops and just have to stay ahead of the next guy. That's all. It has to be one person slower. And if somebody drops out, that doesn't count. You have to be one person faster and the next person that finishes, you know, last. It's, it's yeah, it's a new, new sort of test for you. And new they sort of challenge. start at noon, so the heat of the day. And they also have introduced a 24-hour, 80-mile immolation on the same course this year. So you don't know who's who and who's the 40, who's the 80. So that'll be interesting. And if I get knocked out the first couple of loops, then I'll just stay and volunteer, you know. But um and then I signed up for, they have a 102 mile ultra the weekend of New Year's Eve. So what's different about that too is there are like five different events, but they're very tight time limits and it's all on that sugar sand, same course. So I think you start with like a 50K, then, and depending when you finish, that dictates how much time you have off between the events. Then you have a, so end up 50K, then you do like a marathon, then a half marathon, then a 10K, 5K, very tight windows of finish time. So that's my new thing now, because you always give me workouts with different pacing. You know, once you get warmed up, you switch over to the fat burn, you feel it up your pace. My pace is the same, whether I'm running like a five mile or a 10 mile or 25 mile, you know, I tend to run the same. So now I'm starting to experiment. Well, can I push a little? 
for a couple of miles because, you know, I'm used well, to having all day long in the hospital. So I tend to pace myself slow and steady. The tortoise, the tortoise. So can I, can I hop in a little hair in there, you know, and, and that's, so that's what I'm experimenting with now. Wow. Wow. Great. Well, thanks Kathy very much for this. And, uh, you know, you, you, uh, you know, you had the courage to, well, first of all, the intelligence to say so many years ago, you know, why did I bonk? And why does, why would a human bonk? It doesn't make sense. And why did, why would we be swallowing sugar to fuel us when that's not our physiology? So you were smart enough to realize it and then brave enough to go against the narrative and talk about it. And it's nothing short of life saving for people because we could just empty out the hospitals and, you know, just have people. I see a world of like Olympic games going on all over. <laughs> well, well, I think, I think this is a great way to close that is like I say, you're, you're on both ends of that spectrum. Like you're in the ICU and the trauma bay working on people who have pushed their limit to the one side of health and see how, how they, if they can stay alive, right. At that far edge. And then you're, pushing yourself and working with us to help athletes, you know, cause I consider you Jeff Browning, you're part of that whole research team in that pool of athletes that we're at that outer edge of what's possible on that end. And we keep, you know, we keep pushing that. I mean, this data we have now where Peter and Jeff uh, can sustain over two grams a minute of fat burn is, it's like that's. And the VO two max, like, yeah. Like at a high level of effort, that's what I'm telling myself. You have to start pushing. Yeah. You can start burning predominantly fat at a much higher effort level. Than anybody has ever predicted. It feels like yeah. because that's the next barrier for me is that I could go fast. And yep. um, yeah, it's, I mean, I tell people, you don't have to believe us. You don't have to believe me. If what you're doing, if you're fit, you can go out and run a marathon tomorrow. and you know, fasted and you're good, no problem. And you're a good weight and you're a, a stable mind and you feel fantastic all the time. But like, you know, I see these people come in and they're going to have bypass surgery. And you ask, I ask myself, they're not going to change something that they were doing that got them into this situation. Why would those new vessels behave any differently than the old That's ones? Right matter of time and so my responsibility is to say medicine is beautiful in a crisis we can pull you back from the brink but let's live in a way that we don't ever need to be rescued like that you know well and, and, yeah and that's the thing it's like from from being you know our conversations in with you as an icu and trauma surgeon and then what we're doing and what you're experiencing I mean, we're learning, you learn things from the fringe. So people don't have to go to the fringe. That's what we're doing to bring this to them. Yes. But still come out and run a hundred miles with me because it's more <laughs> fun with friends. Yeah. All right, Kathy. Well, thanks very much. All, All right. right. Have a great day. Yep. Bye.